Welcome to Boards on Board, Managing Governance Risks for Mission Success. This is Melanie Herman, Executive Director of the Nonprofit Risk Management Center. I want to thank the team at Guide One Insurance for planning and sponsoring this webinar. I hope you enjoy it and find value in the content I'm going to share and that you'll be able to implement and experiment with some of the tips and recommendations I offer for improving governance in your organization. There are two major topics we're going to cover in this webinar. The first is a series of governance mistakes and missteps. And these are mistakes that I've seen occur in nonprofit organizations we work with here at the Nonprofit Risk Management Center, but they're also mistakes that I've encountered as a board member of various nonprofit organizations. I hope they seem familiar, but not overwhelming. We're going to talk about how each of these mistakes occur and how they occur, but also, more importantly, how you can prevent them from occurring and also address them if they, they are happening at your organization. And then the second major topic I want to cover today is really how to help your board stay on track with all of its governance responsibilities. I sometimes say that serving on a board is serious business. It should be rewarding. It should be fun, but it's, it's also difficult and serious business. And ideally, you want every member of the board to take their governance responsibilities very seriously and to come to that role with commitment and intent. But there are so many different ways that you can help a board stay on track or get back on track if it gets off track. And hopefully, we'll cover all of those. I chose a quote from an episode of Seinfeld to, to share on the slide with the agenda. It just reminded me of the fact that I think sometimes board members and staff members of nonprofits don't realize that their boards are broken or that changes are necessary to improve governance, that sometimes we're a little bit naive or Pollyanna about governance. And we also sometimes discount the fact that strong governance is an important foundational issue in an organization. If you have a weak board or you have weak or ineffective governance processes, you're really shortchanging your mission and you're preventing the organization from really doing all that it can do. So it's so important to first acknowledge weaknesses and identify what some of those weak points are before you can take any action. So let's go ahead and talk about what I'm calling six familiar but fixable governance mistakes. And these are six of my favorite. Um, I had quite a bit of experience with all of them, both as a board member and also as an advisor to nonprofit boards and leadership teams. The first one's very common, and I'm calling this lack of role clarity. Something I've learned in my work with nonprofits over many years is that everybody who comes to a nonprofit organization, whether it's a volunteer or a paid staff member or a member of a governing board or board committee, everybody who comes to your organization really wants to do a good job. There are very few, if any, people who come with the in, intent of, of performing poorly. So what is it that stands in the way um, of doing a good job, of living up to the expectations you set for yourself? Well, not understanding your role is a, is a primary culprit, and we see this so many times in otherwise well-run organizations and organizations with really strong and compelling missions that nobody has taken the time to really describe what it is they expect from key stakeholders in the organization. And the board is no different. So every member of your board needs to understand, you know, what is my job? What is the role of the board generally? What is our shared governance responsibility? What sorts of behaviors and actions um, should I display, should be in evidence? If I'm doing my job, how will I know I'm doing a great job as a board member? So it really can't be emphasized enough the importance of taking time to figure out what the board's role is and then describing it and sharing it with those leaders that you've asked to volunteer their time to serve on your board. We'll talk about some strategies for achieving role clarity in just a few minutes, but that's definitely at the top of my list of fixable governance mistakes. A second common mistake that I see is what I'm calling an outdated framework for governance. So when an organization is created, there is a, an initial governance framework, and it's usually 
articulated in the form of articles of incorporation and bylaws and sometimes other governing documents as well. But somebody or a group of people have come together and, and written down how the organization will be structured, what governance looks like, it's kind of like a governance roadmap. Unfortunately, those roadmaps are sometimes treated like um, important historical documents that can't be changed rather than documents that need to be changed as the organization changes. So a common example uh, of a problem in this area would be governing documents that describe a structure that's well suited to a small new organization, but really doesn't suit a very large, complex organization. So we frequently see outdated governance materials, uh, pieces of that governance framework. And again, I'm talking about the bylaws and board policies and position descriptions. And yet some leaders feel so somewhat hesitant or reluctant to change those documents. They feel that, that they are historical documents in a way and should be left the way they were original, originally created. And I guess in my experience with, with both effective and, and less effective organizations, to me a hallmark of an effective organization is one that really makes a commitment to update all of its frameworks, whether it's the organizational chart for the staff, the bylaws for the board, the code of conduct for participants, that you know, when we revisit these materials and these resources and we update them based on current realities, you know, the changing world around us, we're really putting ourselves in the strongest possible position for success. So we'll talk in a few minutes about specific aspects of that framework that need to be updated and that you should take a look at. But if you have any sense as you think about your own organization that you are relying on a framework, a structure for the board, whether it's the board size, the number of committees, the purpose of the committees, the frequency of meetings, all of those pieces are components of, of structure. If you have any sense that those may be outdated, then I would encourage you to think about the, taking action to bring them into the current, into your current world and making certain that they're based on current circumstances. My third familiar but fixable governance mistake is a suboptimal on-ramp. We all know that you know, before starting any role, whether it's a paid role or a volunteer role, we all need a little bit of an orientation. We need an introduction to what we will be doing. And yet, even though I think many nonprofit leaders know this intuitively, many of us don't plan and deliver board orientations. And I think one of the reasons for that is that we assume that somebody who's worthy of being elected to serve on our board knows how to be a board member. They've already been on all their boards, perhaps, or they're somebody who's had a, a wonderful career. Uh, they have a wonderful reputation in our community and so forth. But it, it's a problem to assume that someone knows how to be a member of your board and to assume that they, they're familiar with, for example, the legal responsibilities of board members of rules related to confidentiality, of the culture of your organization. There's so many things that if you only take the time to share them with new board members, you're doing them such a great service and helping them serve your mission most effectively. One of the things I've learned from doing many board exit interviews is concern from departing board members that they, they were never really given the tools they needed to be successful, that, that they were at elected to the board and att started attending board meetings and, and were left to figure it out as they went along. You don't want to make that mistake with your board. Uh, the work of the board is too important to your mission, to your ultimate success. You want to equip every board meeting member with the tools they need to be very successful on the job from the very first board meeting all the way through to their, to their exit, to their last board meeting. The next familiar but fixable governance mistake that I've seen time and time again is what I'm referring to as wing and a prayer board recruitment and selection process. I've also referred to this uh, mistake as arm twisting board recruitment, and it's really that the failure to think of board recruitment and selection as a process 
as a screening process, as a vetting process. Some organizations are still uh, just hoping that uh, individuals with influence, individuals um, who are committed to the mission, individuals who have plenty of time to, to spend in board activities will somehow show up and volunteer to serve and then serve successfully. I, I think nonprofit missions are too important and uh, compelling to leave board recruitment and selection to chance. So don't leave that process to chance. Actually commit to having a thoughtful process with a series of steps and really um, high goals and aspirations to find the best possible board members for your mission. We'll talk a little bit more about how to do that in just a few minutes. All right, number five on my list is what I'm calling tired board agendas. So all of these issues are fixable. They're, they are things that we can address by taking some pretty simple steps. Uh, this one, though, in particular, is so easy to fix and can be fixed as of your next board meeting. And it's simply to take the old-fashioned board agenda, the one that you've seen hundreds of times if you've been in the nonprofit sector for, for any period of time, um, the, the standard agenda which starts with the reading of the minutes and then continues with the committee reports. And then at the very end lists new business um, or strategic planning initiative. Right? You've all seen this agenda that starts with the, the very formal parts of the agenda, the very um, uh, repetitive um, components, and then ends with the really hard questions the organization is facing. So we're going to talk about how to flip that agenda and really put that, that old board agenda aside and start with something fresh. It's something that is a, relates more effectively to the energy and connects to the energy that people bring to a board meeting, which is typically highest at the very beginning. And the last topic I wanted to talk about on my list of familiar but fixable governance mistakes is lack of board and officer succession planning. So this is an interesting topic in that we could broaden it to say that lack of succession planning in general is a weakness in many nonprofit organizations. Lack of succession planning for the CEO position, lack of succession planning for key staff positions. But today I want to focus on lack of succession planning for, for board roles and officer roles. And I've seen this time and time again, and most recently on, on one of the boards that I serve on, where we realized that every year when our officers um, come to the end of their period of service, we're in kind of a scramble mode trying to identify who will be the next board chair, who will be the next board treasurer, who will be the next board secretary, and so forth. And so our planning group gave us some thought and came to the conclusion that we need to have a longer runway for these officer roles, that we shouldn't be looking for a new officers in the fall to begin their service the first of the year. We should actually be talking to people about possibly serving as officers more than a year out from the date that they would begin serving in those roles. So succession planning is, is just such an important issue in terms of ensuring a, a smooth um, uh, or smooth transitions and um, very uh, capable and competent governing function in your organization. So I have a few suggestions as to how to approach a succession planning here. We're going to get to all of those tips um, as we turn to the next slide and continue with this presentation. So I want to share some thoughts on how to help your board stay on track. And in some cases, these tips relate to one particular uh, familiar and, uh, and but fixable governance uh, mistakes. And in other cases, they, they relate to multiple mistakes that we see in governance. So the first one really does relate to multiple mistakes, and that is the recommendation to communicate with care from start to finish. Communications is so important to, to not only helping the board actually serve effectively, but also helping the board really feel engaged in the organization, feel connected to your mission, connected to what you're doing. And that they're not separate and in in, in outside the organization, but they are an important stakeholder group that is grounded in, in the mission of the organization and is key to its success. So my tips to communicate with CARE include the following. The first is spend time on that orientation. Help board members get the best possible start to their period of service. 
put together an orientation book, a handbook, a packet of materials that includes information on some general governance principles such as the legal duties of nonprofit boards, um, but also includes information on your organization, prior budgets perhaps, your annual report, uh, minutes of prior board meetings, a, a thorough packet of material that helps them hit the ground running and, and, and helps them see uh, some of the important things that have happened before they arrived. So an orientation materials are, are so, so important. And with the orientation, make sure that it's a planned, thoughtful education session, that you're not just bringing people into the room and just finding out if they have questions and, 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 and conducting the orientation too informally. You know, show them that board business is serious business by planning and, and structuring a, a thorough orientation. I remember uh, a few years back, I joined the board of a national organization, and I was invited to attend my first board orientation as a board member. And I remember seeing the agenda thinking, you know, my goodness, this is a half-day program. What a long commitment. What a substantial commitment they're asking me to make just to go to the orientation. And then the next day, I have to go to a board meeting that, that's being held all day. And, and I recall looking at that agenda thinking, there's no way this will take a half day. I, I know a lot about governance, and I've been on boards before. I was just blown away by how helpful that orientation was. I'll never forget that orientation, and it, and it dates back quite a few years now. There, there were so many interesting topics covered, both in general governance topics, but also topics really germane to this particular organization, you know, its mission, its history. I remember there was a presentation on how governance had evolved at the organization, how, how one style had been kind of uh, put aside and a new style was adopted. There was a discussion about board norms, you know, what to do in the middle of a board meeting if somebody offended you, if you felt offended, um, and how the board made decisions as a group the style of the board meetings. Um, and the other thing I loved about the orientation, and I've really tried to model in the orientations I've led since that time, is the fact that there were multiple speakers. Uh, the board chair spoke. The CEO spoke. The treasurer of the board spoke. The chief financial officer of the organization spoke. There were multiple speakers. And so we got to hear about governance generally and also governance specifically from multiple voices different points of view. So it was really a, a very rich um, presentation. I remember the time flew by, and by the, the most important lesson, though, was by the time that orientation ended, I felt ready and equipped to proceed into that board, my first board meeting, and be a full participant. And I was so excited to, uh, to move on and, and be that board member. Another added benefit was I got to know the members of my class, the others who were elected to serve the same period of years as I was. I got to know them pretty well in that half-day training. And we had this amazing camaraderie that really began at the orientation but continued into the first board meeting and really continued throughout our period of service. So focus on orientation and, and show the board that, you know, board business is serious business, but you're here to help and you're going to equip them with what they need to serve effectively. A second communications tool that I found very helpful is what I call the, the periodic memo from the CEO. And I did start um, producing these memos for my own board nearly 20 years ago after one of my board members suggested that I pen a weekly or monthly memo with just an update on the organization. And, and I have to be honest, when I first heard the suggestion, I thought, you know, this is going to take a lot of time. And just sitting to prepare a, a weekly or monthly memo in addition to preparing board materials and, and doing all the, the traditional you know, work to which I'm assigned um, just seemed like an added responsibility. And I worried that I might not be able to, to fully meet that commitment. But I have to say in my own personal experience, this weekly memo or monthly memo has done more to improve the perception the board has about how engaged they are and their sense of engagement, their feelings of engagement than anything else we've done um, in our relationship with the board. And I've noticed that some of the boards I sit on, um, their CEOs have adopted a similar practice of just sending a memo out to the board periodically to provide an update 
on the programs and services and opportunities facing the organization, um, the great news, um, cautionary notes about sometimes not so good news. Uh, these memos help board members feel connected to the organization in between board meetings. So really suggest you, you consider doing this if you're not already doing that. And, you know, set a schedule that makes sense for you. Don't commit to weekly memos. If you really don't have enough information to share on a weekly basis, um, perhaps think about monthly or biweekly memos and make them short, make them salient. Uh, remember that it's okay to repeat some items, to reinforce things. So uh, you may have some topics that you repeat from week to week or reminders of something that you mentioned a couple of weeks ago. And I almost guarantee that uh, you'll see you'll get a positive reaction from board members who really will feel more engaged because they're receiving this great information. All right, the third communication step I wanted to share is the idea of board exit interviews. Now, this is something that most organizations probably don't do, or if they do, then they don't do them really consistently. It's such an excellent practice, and there are so many potential benefits of doing exit interviews, and it, it touches on and, and supports your goals to fix these, these fixable issues or mistakes that I, that I ran through a few minutes ago. Um, a board exit interview is, when, when done effectively, is a one-on-one -on -one conversation, typically between a member of your governance committee or your nominating committee or a specific committee of the board, um, a conversation between a board member and a current board member and somebody who's leaving. And it's a chance to ask them just a handful of questions. And preferably, they should be done either in person or by telephone. So some of the questions I would recommend you ask would be things like, what did you most enjoy about serving on this board? I'd also ask, was there anything you didn't enjoy about serving on the board? Um, how would you rate the orientation we provided? How helpful or not so helpful was that orientation? And then another great question to ask in your exit interviews um, is one from my colleague Carol Weissman, um, who, who writes mainly about fundraising but also about governance. And she's a wonderful resource on, on issues related to both topics. And Carol suggests that you include in your exit interviews the following question. If we could reach out to you in the future and ask you to do one thing for this organization, what would that be? You can word that in, in, a, in a slightly different way or a, a completely different way, but the essence is, is asking somebody who's leaving the organization, you know, if we could reach out to you in the future for something, what, what should that be or could that be? So I've had the chance to, to actually conduct quite a few exit interviews as, as, my role, um, as part of my role as a member of a governance committee of a nonprofit board. And exit interviews are fun. You know, you have a chance to thank somebody for their service, to find out what they enjoyed, find out what, find out what they didn't enjoy, and then also find out, you know, if we can call on you in the future, you know, on what topic would that be. And in the exit interviews I've conducted recently, I've, I've heard such inspiring commentary. I mean, one board member told me that she loves advocacy, that she she loves presenting the organization's case or making the case for the organization in front of staff members um, from in the legislative branch. And she said, if you ever need somebody to do that, give me a call. And I was so taken by that because so many people would, would not want to engage in that type of activity or be interested in that type of activity. So the fact that this was something she loved doing and was willing to do I thought was really great information for the organization to use. Um, somebody else I interviewed for a board exit interview said, you know, in the future, I hope to be able to give a much bigger donation, financial donation. So you can always call on me when it comes to fundraising. If you need a contribution, call on me, and I will do my best to give more and more. So, so much of that information that comes from these exit interviews is very uplifting, and it's great as a board member to hear that. Um, but of course, some of the the information shared during exit interviews can help you make various aspects of governance stronger, such as the orientation. One of the board members I interviewed told me that uh, she wished she'd had a mentor, somebody on the board who could sit with her, coach her, just give her some tips on how to be the best board member possible. 
And after hearing that, we actually went back and decided to pair up new board members with veteran board members and kind of have a buddy system or a mentoring program for the board. So some of the things you hear in those exit interviews, you can actually implement pretty quickly and inexpensively or you know, within a short period of time. Communi you've heard it from other people, but communication is so important, and it's absolutely true in terms of communicating with your board. I hope these tips are helpful as you think about, you know, how can I improve communication with the board and between the board? So on this next slide, I've just depicted what I'm calling the board service life cycle. And the idea was to just let you know that, yeah, there, there's kind of an arc of service when you're on a nonprofit board. Uh, there is that vetting stage where you're being considered as a possible board member. During that stage, you're often curious about the role and responsibility of a board member. What's expected of me? What's the time commitment? Is there a financial commitment? So during that vetting process, you're learning a lot about the organization. You're really trying to, to get clarity about what would, will be expected of you. From the organization's perspective, you should be sharing information and helping that prospect um, reach clarity about their role. And then during orientation, you have an opportunity to reinforce the role and really explain in clear terms you know, what is expected of that new board member. I think other topics that you want to address in the board orientation are things like um, legal duties of nonprofit boards as well as a review of your governance structure. So hopefully something interesting, not, not just a, a dry you know, overview of the bylaws, but really talking about how the board works, how it's structured, why it's structured in a certain way, and really how it works. And don't be, don't be surprised to hear from board members that, wow, this is, different. this is a different structure from what I'm accustomed to. Or I serve on another nonprofit board where the structure is, is quite different from that. And I mentioned a few minutes ago the idea of board pairing or a, a buddy or, or mentor program. That can be anything from formal, could last you know, for the first year of service, or, or maybe it's just a pairing up during that new board member's first meeting. And I've certainly seen it work that way, and, and it's been very effective. And then the final stage in the board service life cycle, of course, is the offboarding. It's when that board member is getting ready to leave the organization. It may be that their term has ended and you have term limits, or it may be that they have to leave the board for personal reasons, or in some cases the board member may be asked to leave. So there are various reasons um, for departure from a board, but regardless of the reason, you should really think of it as an off-boarding process. And I would even suggest that you still um, conduct an exit interview with a board member who's leaving for maybe not so favorable reasons. So if somebody's been asked to leave or there's been some sort of dispute, um, there's some reason for disagreement between the board member and the board and, and they've decided to leave, I think it's still valuable to conduct an exit interview and I would en encourage you to do that. So my second tip um, dovetails with some of the other topics we've been talking about, and that is to define and reinforce board roles. Again, you have that opportunity to do it in the creation of various governing documents, the updating of your bylaws, the creation of board member position descriptions, but you can reinforce those roles in the board orientation during board meetings and so forth. So some of the most important pieces that help leaders define and reinforce board roles are the board member position description. It's, we use position descriptions for paid staff. We really should use them for the board as well. Uh, many organizations have a general board description, board position description that describes uh, what it means to be a board member, and then specific, more detailed position descriptions for the officer roles. I think that's a great um, way to approach it. Another tool that I found very useful in helping to define and reinforce board roles um, would be the committee charter. And I would encourage you to take a look at your pack of governing documents and see if you have charters for each of your board committees. And ideally, a charter is about one page in length, and it describes the purpose of the committee, describes the authority of the committee. It may describe how often the committee meets, and also the membership of the committee, for example, whether it consists of you know, 
it's limited to board active board members or it includes some board members and some non-board members. So really all of that should be addressed in the charter. And a great way to test whether your charters are effective and, and really comprehensive is, is to ask, you know, if this committee were meeting and a question came up, you know, what is our purpose? Or are we allowed to do that? Or what's our authority? Or why are we here? You know, if any of those questions should arise during a committee meeting, the charter should provide the answer. And I've served on many board committees where we pull out that charter frequently. Maybe not at every meeting, but from time to time we pull that out and say, wait a second, let's go back to our charter and just confirm that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that we're not uh, overstepping our authority, uh, we're not stepping on the toes of another committee, that we really are fulfilling this charter. Another um, thought about charters is that charters sometimes become out of date. So circumstances have changed and there's a need to update the charter. One of the most common changes in charters I've seen recently is the uh, expansion of a charter from one specific role to something broader. So we've seen quite a few organizations try to add risk oversight to one of their board committee charters. And probably the, the most popular choice uh, for that expansion of role is the audit committee. So we worked with a number of groups that have decided to take their audit committee from a committee focused solely on the annual financial statement audit to one that's focused both on audit and risk oversight. And so we've been able to help draft language and verbiage that can be used to expand the role of that committee charter. But I, I think at a minimum those committee charters should be reviewed by each committee on an annual basis. And each committee should be asking, is this still relevant? Is this purpose relevant? Do these functions des describe what we do, what we should be doing? And if there are situations where the committee charter has become out of date, then the committee really should be the group to propose changes and, and, and bring those to the board for discussion and approval. And obviously the board as a whole is looking at things like, do these committee charters line up well? You know, is there a, an appropriate division of labor? Sometimes on a nonprofit board, the governance committee, uh, sometimes called the nominating committee, but more uh, increasingly referred to or as the governance committee, uh, that committee looks at not only the slate of nominees for officer and board roles, but also what are the governing practices of this organization. And so that committee is off, often charged with looking at those charters and making certain that they fit well together. But I think it is it's something else that uh, an individual committee, each individual committee should look at from time to time. Certainly have that charter handy as it works through its agenda on an annual basis. So the last point I wanted to make on this topic is that all of these governing documents, these resources that are provided to members of your governing body should sync with your bylaws. And here at NRMC we often see out of date bylaws. So an organization will change how it governs and who governs and the governance processes but not update the bylaws. And so you have these out of date bylaws and that's problematic. So Make certain that your bylaws are kept up to date, that they really reflect what you're doing and how you're structured and how you operate, and that you don't have discrepancies between these committee charters or board position descriptions and your bylaws. Um, something else just came to mind, and that is the idea that some bylaws have very detailed descriptions of committees and descriptions of board member roles, and others just refer to those separate documents. I think the latter approach is probably more manageable because if you've updated a position description or an officer description, you don't have to go back and, and update the bylaws as well. But in, in some cases, organizations and leadership teams prefer to have the bylaws really capture those roles in, in a detailed fashion. So that's something that, that you, you want to think about and decide what's best for your organization. So my third topic to help keep your board um, on track or get your board back on track or stay on track is this concept of board structure and the idea that you know, every charitable mission deserves the best possible foundation and structure to support that mission. I think sometimes leadership teams accept a good enough structure, something that, that kind of works, 
instead of instead of something that that works exceptionally well. So some of the questions that came to mind as I thought about this topic uh, include, you know, what structure will advance our mission? Are there any aspects of our current structure that hold us back? Um, one of the comments I've heard from from some of my board experiences um, has been that, you know, we have too many committees or we have such a hard time getting a quorum at our committee meetings because we have so many committees and committee meetings are held so frequently. Um, or our board has become too large. Um, I've also seen situations where the board is too small. So, and there is no no single answer to to the question. You know, how large should your board be? The answer really is is what will be most effective in advancing your mission and supporting the work you're trying to do. And at some periods during your history, a small board, uh, a small and nimble board may be desirable, and in other times, a larger resourceful board will be needed. Um, I read an article recently that said that the average size of a nonprofit board is 18 members, um, but that's just the average from a particular survey that was done. So you really have to think about what structure will suit your organization. And when you think about structure, I want you to be thinking about this, not only the size of the board, but also the number of committees and the purpose of those committees, the expectations of board members, the, the type and frequency of meetings. I was recently having a conversation with a colleague about whether we should have um, four in-person board meetings per year or two, and, and two meetings by telephone, and, and what are the downsides of meeting by telephone, what are the upsides, um, what's happening um, among the members of our board and in our, in our work that necessitates or doesn't uh, necessitate an in-person meeting. And so these are all good questions, and I, I just hope you aren't accepting a structure that's outdated or a structure that was created decades ago and you're afraid to tweak it or, or transform it. These are really important issues that can, once fixed and addressed, can really improve the effectiveness of the board. So my suggestion for kind of a process for making changes to board structure is that a smaller group, such as a, an existing board committee or a task force, consider changes, the potential impact of changes in any aspect of structure, and kind of formulate what it believes would be the best structure moving forward, or even some options to change the structure, and that these changes be really vetted with the entire board. Uh, there are different ways to do this. So the committee that recommend structural changes, may reach out to board members individually to solicit their feedback, may, may reach out to the committees as small groups to, to solicit each committee's feedback, or may perhaps make a presentation to the full board to solicit its, its feedback you know, as a group. But it's important that everybody on the board be given the opportunity to offer suggestions about changes in structure, um, weigh in with their own thoughts about pros and cons and, and different ways to uh, change the structure to the benefit of the organization. Then, of course, once any changes to structure are made, you need to make sure that your governing documents are consistent with those changes in structure. So in many cases, that means updating your bylaws to reflect how you intend to govern uh, going forward. So we've already talked a little bit about this fourth topic, which is conducting a thorough orientation. Um, I just wanted to point out some of the mistakes I've seen, uh, assuming new board members know how to be great members of your board. I've seen this over and over again, and perhaps you've experienced this as well, the kind of assumption that because somebody's been on two or three other boards, they will know how to be a great board member, and then finding out that that is not the case. I've even seen uh, the assumption that somebody has been on other boards. I've been on a, a national board where when the question was asked, you know, what other boards have you served on, several people raised their hands and said, none, this is my first. And so even just making, making any assumption uh, can be problematic and get us into trouble. But please don't assume that the new members of your board know how to be great members. You need to show them and, and provide the tools they need to be great, great board members. Another mistake is just to, you know, assume that people are too busy to attend a, a thorough orientation. You know, in my experience, the opposite is true. People are busy, but they, they really want to attend an orientation. They're eager to attend an orientation. 
And I would also encourage you to, to make sure that you open up your orientation to veteran board members. So somebody who's been on the board for a couple of years may be interested in getting a kind of a reorientation. I recently helped uh, facilitate an orientation for a board that I serve on, and I was surprised at the number of veteran board members who attended who said, I really didn't do this. You know, when I joined the board, this wasn't offered, or I thought it would be a, a nice time to kind of refresh my knowledge of these issues. So open the orientation up to everybody on the board. Don't assume that lack of interest. Don't try to rush it. I think the orientations I've seen that have worked really well have been three to four hours in length, perhaps with a couple of breaks. But again, the length of the orientation, the, the detailed nature of the agenda, the thoroughness of the packet of materials, all of these things work together to convey that governance is serious business and you really want to help equip your board members to do their best work. And then another mistake I've seen in board orientations is where the orientation is presented by one person. And even in my, my history at NRMC, in the early days, um, the orientation consisted of just a one-on-one -on -one meeting between myself and the new board member, and we would talk about the board, and the board member would ask questions, and I would provide answers, and we would engage with one another about that individual's term of service. But looking back, I can see that although that was helpful, that was a nice kind of uh, way to get to know a new board member, it doesn't equal a, a true board orientation where information is shared from multiple perspectives. Some of the topics that I would encourage you to include on that orientation agenda, um, first of all, the legal responsibilities of the board. So, you know, it's so important to, to revisit these issues, the duty of obedience, the, the idea that board members must be faithful to the organization's mission when making decisions on the organization's behalf. The duty of care, the reminder that to really demonstrate the duty of care, a board member should be informed about the issues that are being presented to the board. A board member should be comfortable and willing and prepared to ask questions. Uh, the board members should be thoughtful stewards of the resources of the organization. And then really that's how they, they show that duty of care. And then the duty of loyalty the idea that board members must give undivided allegiance when making decisions affecting the organization. So these are the three legal duties that uh, you've probably heard about. Again, duty of obedience, duty of care, and duty of loyalty. Um, I had an experience with a board several years ago where during the orientation, a member asked the question you know, about the duty of loyalty, and she said, you're saying that I that I need to give undivided allegiance when I'm when I'm voting, making a decision affecting the organization. But but she said I was elected by this group from California, and I believe that it's my job to represent California. I should be speaking up for the for the members of this organization that are from California. And so, how can I do that if I'm giving undivided allegiance to the organization as a whole? Really, I'm really here to give allegiance to the to the group from California that sent me here to serve on this board. And so it was a chance for me to remind her that even though this particular organization had kind of a representative board where board members were elected in part because they represented different constituencies, that once elected to the board, you know, everyone shares that duty of loyalty, the idea of, of giving undivided allegiance when making decisions affecting the organization. And that that duty of, of loyalty really trumps that um, those representative responsibilities. It's true that she should feel free to share concerns from the stakeholder group she represents, but when voting and taking action, she really has to be able to put, and, and all of us do who serve on nonprofit boards, we all need to be able to put the interests of the organization as a whole um, at the top and paramount to uh, interests of any stakeholder group or personal interests um, that we, of course, bring to the table, those biases and and um, interests that are invariable, invariably part of, of who we are. Another great topic for board orientation is the board's culture and governing style. And, and again, it's easy to assume that new board members understand board culture or that your culture is similar to others, but it's such a great topic for your orientation. You know, how do we govern? Or do we have a very formal style? Do we use something like Robert's Rules of Order and or, or some hybrid or a version of it? 
or is it a more informal culture where if you have a question, you may address it to anybody around the table and um, your um, your thoughts or your request to change the agenda or take a break or um, you know your interactions with the board should be very informal and comfortable versus a more formal style. So talking about the governing style is is so important during orientation. And what it does is it just helps those new board members and those veteran members attending feel comfortable that when they they shift into board into the board meeting, they they really know what's permitted, what's expected, um, how the board really really operates. Another terrific topic for a board orientation is the top challenges and opportunities faced in the organization. So an overview of, of what are the big issues we are facing, what are we dealing with, um, or if there's been a recent crisis or issue that's been dealt with by the board, how did we deal with that? You know, what was that issue specifically, and, and, and how did the board respond? And, and what did it look like you know, as it was on the horizon when we were in the middle of it, and now as we look back on it? Um, again, sharing this information just gives, helps the board get a, the new board members get a running start and have the best possible on-ramp to their period of service. And then the, the last topic I listed um, is the relationship with staff. And I, ideally for me, the relationship between the board and the CEO of, the non, of a nonprofit is, is a constructive partnership. And by that I mean a relationship where each party sees great value in the other's role. So as a CEO, I feel I see great value in the work and the role of my board and vice versa. But that each party also recognizes that they can't do their job without the other party. So I know as a CEO, I can't be effective in my role without my board. And I'd like to think that every member of the board feels that, that they can't be effective and do what they're supposed to do as board members without um, a connection to the CEO. So. Those relationships, you know, range from really strong and that constructive partnership that I've just described to weak or broken, uh, contentious. You know, I've seen them all, but it's so important that you address this in the orientation and let let the board members attending know what what is the nature of our relationship with our CEO. How do we work together? Um, one of the common styles I've seen on many nonprofit boards is where members of the board have kind of a formal role where they deliberate and consider policy issues and, and vote at board meetings, but they also serve as, as something of a kitchen cabinet for the CEO. They're resources on various subjects from you know my area, which is risk management to human resources to technology management, volunteer management, fundraising, and so forth. And the CEO who has um, questions or just wants another person's perspective or to tap into a a, a network of resources knows they can call a particular board member um, who will provide great advice and counsel on, on a particular issue. So there are lots of different roles and relationships, um, but I think talking about them at orientation is important so your, your new board members and your veteran board members really understand uh, what the, the style is with your particular organization. So my fifth recommendation is to revolutionize board recruitment. And I mentioned a little bit earlier that some organizations still engage in what I call that arm twisting form of board recruitment where they, they're pleading with people to join the board. I think this is such, a, such an important thing to change and it's, it's not uh, difficult to achieve, a kind of a transformation of your recruitment process. It really starts with a mindset with this mindset that, that serving on this board is a great honor and therefore we're going to take care and use, great, use thoughtfulness and be deliberate in choosing and identifying people who are suited for board service but also selecting those we're going to put forward and nominate as board members or officers of the organization. And I think your nominating committee, or it may be your board development committee or governance committee, you may have a different name for it, really needs to recognize its role uh, in, in terms of, of creating this pipeline of prospective board members, uh, a pipeline of, of talent, of strong talent, of diverse talent that can help the organization achieve its goals and objectives. So another tip I wanted to offer on this topic of board recruitment is the idea that you should focus on promise rather than pedigree. 
And you know, I've thought about board recruitment processes as processes I've been involved in over many years. And in so many cases, there seems to be this um, tendency to focus on whether somebody is a person of, of financial means, whether somebody uh, seems to have great influence in the community, whether they, their pedigree, if you will, um, includes their association with various prominent groups or their, uh, they, they hold certain professional degrees or designations or they've achieved a certain a place of prominence in their career, and I call that I refer to that as pedigree, and I, I see that as problematic because assuming that somebody with a certain pedigree and a background, um, x number of years of experience and prior board service and somebody of financial means, assuming that they will be a great, engaged and effective board member, um, it is dangerous uh, because in so many cases uh, that may not be the case. So. In so many instances, that this is not true. And to me, a better approach is to find out what these interested individuals, these potential volunteers, prospective board members, what they would like to do to support your mission, what they're willing to do to support your mission. And the best way to do that is really to just ask them point blank, is to engage in either a telephone conversation, or in some cases they might want to re refer or um, refer to some written questions that you send in advance, but to, to ask them what they know about the organization and why they're interested in serving on the board and, and what they hope to bring to the table. And not to make these grand assumptions about what they can do for the organization based on their, their professional background, their service at another organization, and so forth. Another tip I wanted to share is the, the idea that we should view board recruitment as a marathon and not a sprint. And I've seen this, this time and time again where two months before the end of the fiscal year, the governance committee is scrambling to find four or five people to serve as officers and another four or five to, to fill the board slots that are being vacated. Really, board recruitment should be something that, that you're doing all year round, that you're constantly looking and trying to source excellent candidates to serve on the governing body of the organization. So. In some ways, the, the governance committee role is one that probably takes up more time if it's a year-round responsibility than if it's just the last minute. But I think many people are willing to serve on governance committees that, that work year-round because it's not this mad rush to find people willing to serve on the board, that it's a thoughtful process. It's about getting to know people who, who might make great candidates for the board. Kind of a related tip here is to set high standards. And something I've seen happen on several boards that I've been, been involved in is that instead of just looking for one person to fill every va each vacancy, we actually look for a pool of, of three to five candidates for every one to two openings. So we set our, our bar very high. We, we know that we're going to actually talk to multiple people uh, who might be interested and suited for one opening. And some people said to me, well, isn't that awkward? What if you talk to somebody and then you end up not putting their name forward and, and, and presenting them as a nominee? And the reality is it could be a little awkward, but if you preface those conversations with prospective members by saying, you know, we're in the early stages of vetting, we're trying to identify a handful of people that would be suited for this opening on our board, and I really can't guarantee that you'll be nominated, but I just want to thank you so much for your time and, and uh, your, your possible interest, and that we're still in the early stages and so forth. So I think you can couch your words and conversation in a way that makes it clear to the individual that being nominated is, is, is not a foregone conclusion. And I actually had this experience personally uh, quite a few years ago. I had a group come to me and ask me if I would consider being on a, a board. And they sent me some questions in advance, and then we had a meeting in person. And a few weeks later, um, they let me know that, you know, thank you so much for your time, but uh, you, you didn't make the final cut. Um, you have great skills and experience, and, and your perspective is, is very unique, but it's, uh, it wasn't as, as important didn't rank as high as some of the other people we spoke to. And instead of being annoyed or offended, it just made me respect that organization even more, that uh, it's an organization that really takes this process seriously, and they don't simply offer a spot to everybody they speak to. So I would encourage you to set high standards for board recruitment. 
All right, let's go back to this topic of the board agenda. And I mentioned earlier that energy levels tend to wane over the course of a, of a board meeting. Whether your board meetings are two hours or ten hours, uh, one day or two days, you've probably noticed that the highest energy levels are at the very beginning of the meeting. And yet, most organizations continue to have these kind of um, old-fashioned agendas that start with the minutes and the committee reports and end with the most important issue facing the organization. One reason for that is that that structure is included in Robert's Rules of Order. So if your bylaws indicate that you follow Robert's Rules of Order, then you're, you're probably following the agenda pattern in, found in Robert's Rules of Order. So first of all, I would discourage you from using Robert's Rules of Order. I think it's a way that, or a strategy or, or approach that stifles conversation, that people who think they understand Robert's Rules um, are in kind of a power position on a board. Uh, you've probably been at a board meeting where somebody uh, said that uh, a motion or a comment was out of order and referred back to Robert's Rules. And uh, it really does stifle conversation and, and makes the atmosphere of the board meeting so much more formal than it needs to be. So I would encourage you to, uh, to stop using Robert's Rules of Order, and, and if your bylaws indicate that you must, um, change your bylaws. But at any rate, um, the agenda, I want to suggest that you start every board meeting with the most important subject at hand. What is the top issue that we need to talk about today? Um, what is the top challenge? What is the biggest opportunity? And, and this would follow some sort of icebreaker kind of reintroductions. But, but tackle that really difficult issue, that challenge um, at the outset, and then finish the meeting with those routine items, the committee reports. It's, a, it's such an interesting and, and incredible change to how you conduct a board meeting. And I hope that those of you listening, many of you listening to this program will give this a try and let me know how it turns out. I've, I've just seen board meetings go from uh, dreary to, to really energetic and um, enjoyable when the, the order of the, the topics is changed from starting with the most important and ending with the routine. It just changes the, the energy in the room, and, and it syncs better with the energy that people bring to board meetings. And then my next tip is to, um, to not let bad behavior ex escalate. And sometimes, you know, in a board setting, we see bad behavior. We see individuals behaving badly. We see people behaving badly towards one another. Um, I'm a huge fan of what, what we call the culture of candor, where somebody uh, has the right and actually the expectation that if they disagree, they will speak up, that it's okay to disagree. It's okay to vote no if you disagree with a vote being taken by the board. Um, that's different from being disagreeable. So this culture of candor is speaking up and speaking and speaking from the heart and pointing things out that you think the board should be aware of, uh, that should be not only acceptable but encouraged, but being disagreeable and rude and impolite, those should be um, discouraged and addressed. Um, and I guess I'm contrasting this idea of a culture of candor with what I'm calling the no-filter conversations. And you've, you've heard that expression or description of the expression, and you know, somebody with no filter says what they think, even if those thoughts are inappropriate or should not be you know, said aloud. Um, so it's just important to cultivate the first, that culture of candor. And along with that, or in order to have a true culture of candor, one that's productive and not um, offensive is, you need to um, encourage board members to point out unacceptable conduct. So, and it, it may be that you have a process for doing that. For example, sometimes the governance committee chair or the board chair would call people out on unacceptable conduct, not necessarily during the board meeting, but maybe during the coffee break or maybe after the board meeting. But to ignore unacceptable conduct really puts your mission in peril. And it's, it's a huge mistake that, that many governing teams make, and, and so important to, to not make that mistake. So if somebody violates the rule of confidentiality, you need to let them know. 
Um, I've seen this on a board where the CEO was sending out a, a monthly memo with information on the organization, and if one of the board members was forwarding it to others, thinking that it was positive news and it was a great way to share information about the nonprofit, when in reality that memo contained some information that was for the board's eyes only. And so somebody had to tell that board member, you know, thank you so much for trying to help us get the word out, but these memos are, are really for your eyes only, and please don't forward them. Um, you know, violating the duty of loyalty. So I gave that example earlier of somebody who felt like they had to vote in a way um, that represented their constituency's views instead of what was in the best interest of the organization. And I think if that happens during a board meeting where somebody makes a statement or, or says, you know, the reason I'm voting this way is because I was elected by this group and I have to represent their views, this is an opportunity to let them know, no, you know, there's a legal duty of loyalty that falls on every board member uh, to give undivided allegiance to the organization when, dis when making decisions affecting the organization. So you must vote uh, for what's in the best interest of this organization as a whole, not what's in your personal best interest or not what's something that might be in the best interest of, an in of your constituency or a particular stakeholder group. Another kind of aspect of bad behavior that should be pointed out um, is when a board member undermines board decisions uh, through conversations that take place outside the boardroom. And anyone who's been on, the, on a board a long time or has lots of board experience has probably encountered this um, in the form of somebody calling you a calling you over in the parking lot to say, can you believe what just happened in there? Or, you know, I don't care what we decided or what was voted on in there. I'm not going to, to follow along. Um, or in kind of a worst case scenario, somebody even posting on a social media site, disagreement with a decision made by the board. And I'm not saying that it's, that it's inappropriate to disagree with the board or a decision made by the board, but as a board member, your job is to, to express that disagreement during the board meeting. Let your voice be heard in the conversation in front of your colleagues. But once the decision has been made, you have a responsibility to support that decision. And if you can't support that decision, then really you should think about stepping off the board. And then just rudeness and being impolite is another or other examples of bad behavior that should be addressed. And in my experience, the best time to address them is when they happen. And I've seen board chairs do this in the middle of a meeting say, you know, uh, Bob, I think you, know, you should rephrase your comment. Uh, your, your comment you know, may have caused some offense by being so critical of a suggestion made by a colleague. Um, it's offensive. Um, could, would you want to take a minute to, to rephrase that and say that in a different way? I've also actually been on a board where it was up to the person who was offended to speak up and say, excuse me, I take offense to what you just said. And, and that gives the person who caused the offense an, uh, an immediate opportunity to, to say what they've said in a different way. And I saw it work beautifully on a particular board where, where the person who caused the offense would say, oh, I'm so sorry, I, I did not mean to say that your suggestion was stupid. What I meant to say was, let's consider at least two possibilities, um, or at least two or three different ways to solve this problem versus just focusing on one. And what's fun to see when, when that happens is that whatever hurt was caused is addressed immediately and it doesn't find its way into the parking lot and it's, it's not continued after the meeting is over. And then the last tip that I wanted to suggest um, for this program is the idea of succession planning. We've talked about it a little bit so far. Uh, you know that uh, you know, board members will at some time, at some point, cycle off your board. Nobody serves forever. I think planning for succession is a real strength in governance. I would also um, suggest that board members serve multiple roles while they are on your board. So, for example, they may serve on the finance committee for a couple of years and then the executive committee for a couple of years and then um, on a different committee, on a governance committee. I think uh, rotating roles is really helpful. It's a way to, to provide varied experiences, to keep everybody's kind of enthusiasm high. You know, when somebody's elected to a board and they're, they're kind of stuck on one committee for their entire period of service, they, they really see the organization through that one lens. So definitely rotate those roles, and I think that can be extremely effective. Um, I also think it's important to ask people what their interests are in leadership roles. So, you know, 
would you be interested in perhaps serving as an officer at some point? Um, are, do you enjoy the current committee you're serving on? Would you like to consider another committee, rotating to another committee? So you know, oftentimes we don't ask these questions, and so we don't know what folks' interests are. And um, then I also think uh, kind of a final piece of this, this discussion about succession planning is that a, a group, sometimes it's the executive committee, in other cases it would be the governance committee or the board development committee, you know, really ponders and thinks about different succession paths. Um, if our current board chair is serving for two years, do we have a vice chair who would like to step into that role when that period of service ends or if there were some sort of emergency? Do one of our other officers um, want to be considered for that chair, board chair role. Um, does somebody who's chairing the finance committee um, want to, sh to move on to another committee after a period of time? So again, just talking about possible succession paths and giving us some thought and not just assuming that the right people will step forward at the right time is so important to having a strong governance function. Well, I hope these thoughts about common but fixable mistakes have been helpful. I hope some of the tips I've suggested have been helpful. I, I want to thank Guide One for sponsoring this program. And you see the contact information for Guide One. I want to also encourage you, if you want to reach out to me directly, it's melanie at nonprofitrisk.org. And again, I'm Melanie Herman, Executive Director of the Nonprofit Risk Management Center. It's been my pleasure to present this information to you, and I, I hope that you find it valuable and useful, and whether you use it immediately or you use it at some point down the road, um, I would love to, to hear about your experiences. And if you have additional thoughts to share that we can you know, circulate to those who register for the webinar, I'd be happy to work with the Guide One team to try to do that. So thank you so much for listening to the program. And I uh, hope you find it useful and, and hope to connect with you on a different topic in the future. Thank you.